Hi guys, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in New York. Today I wanted to talk to you about a really interesting subject which is PFO or patent foramen ovale. Uh, this is also commonly referred to uh, by doctors as a hole in the heart uh, but for strictly speaking that is not an accurate description and I will try and explain why. A PFO is best thought of as a communication uh, between the left heart and the right heart. Usually there is no direct communication between the right heart and the left heart. What tends to happen is that oxygen deprived blood will come from the body. It will go into the right heart. From the right heart it gets pumped into the lungs where it collects oxygen. This oxygen enriched blood then goes to the left heart from where it gets pumped into the body. There's no direct communication between the right heart and the left heart. However, with a PFO uh, there is a direct communication at the level of the atrial septum between the right heart and the left heart. Uh, it is found in about 25 to 30 percent of a um, healthy normal population and in the vast majority of patients it causes no symptoms, it has no impact on length of life and it has no impact on quality of life. However, there are a few rare situations in which it may become important and I will discuss those shortly. Uh, as I said, many people refer to this um, PFO as a hole in the heart, although strictly speaking, it's not actually a hole like you would see a gaping hole in a wall. It's not a fixed um, hole. It's more like a flap or, a, or like a partially closed door. And the reason is that the atrial septum, when it's developing, develops uh, from different layers, and these two layers actually fuse together and that is what causes this to become one structure. However, if these layers are separated slightly, you have a gap. But as you can see, it's not a hole, it's more a flap. And the flap can be opened in certain situations, uh, particularly if you increase the pressure in the right heart. If the pressure in the right heart is increased, that pushes the spot and therefore can open the flap transiently. Uh, situations in which you can uh, increase the pressure on the right heart are particularly uh, during straining or the Valsalva maneuver. So you can transiently increase the pressure on the right heart and if there were a PFO you can transiently increase the separation between the two um, uh, areas of the septum creating this gap through which blood can then go directly from the right heart into the left heart. Uh, the PF, a PFO is a, a, a PFO refers to patent foramen ovale. Uh, a foramen ovale is really very important, particularly in the fetal circulation. Okay, so as I described earlier, in the in after we're born, what happens is blood will go from our right heart to our lungs, collect the oxygen, go to our left heart. From the left heart, it gets pumped to the body. From the body, it comes pumped to the right heart, and from the body, it comes back to the right heart. Um, when uh, Before we're born, however, remember our lungs are not functioning. Our lungs are collapsed, they're non-functional. And actually the oxygen that we derive when we are um, in our mum's wombs is uh, derived from the placenta. So in um, fetal circulation, what tends to happen is that blood will come from the body, oxygen-deprived blood will come from the body, it will go to the placenta, in the placenta it will contain uh, take oxygen, from uh, the placenta it will then go to the right heart. Now remember usually the right heart should pump blood into the lungs but in a fetus the lungs are non-functional, they're collapsed and therefore it's very very difficult uh, for blood to be pumped into these non-functional collapsed lungs um, and, the, and it's wasteful as well uh, and therefore what uh, God gives us is this foramen ovale through which the blood can go directly into the left heart and bypass the lungs. So the blood will go from the placenta to the right heart. From the right heart, it goes through this foramen ovale and into the left heart where it then um, gets pushed to the rest of the body where the oxygen is used up. Uh, when we are born, our lungs suddenly open up. So suddenly the resistance to blood going into the lungs gets a lot less because the lungs are opening up. So the blood starts now going from the right heart into the lungs. From the lungs, this increased blood starts coming back into the left heart, and this increased blood pushes this flap like this, so thereby closing the hole. 
closing the gap. Uh, and as it stays like this, in about 75% of patients, it completely fuses within two years after birth and becomes like a locked door, which is then just because, you know, it has no relevance because it's completely closed and it doesn't open. But in about 25% of patients, what tends to happen is it can still, it may not completely fuse and it is still uh, either slightly open or is uh, uh, openable if you increase the pressure on the right side of the heart. Why it doesn't close in certain people is unclear. However, if we look, we see that in patients who have a PFO, uh, the chance, the, the, there's a much higher chance of finding a sibling also with a PFO. So, you know, if you didn't have a PFO and I screened a sibling, I'd find there would be a 25% chance of finding a PFO in the sibling. However, if you did have a PFO, then the chances of finding a PFO in a sibling are 77%. So they go up by threefold, suggesting that maybe non-closure of these uh, foramen ovale runs in families and therefore may have a genetic basis to it. Okay. Um, now, most patients with a PFO are completely asymptomatic. Okay. There are four situations that you should be aware of in which a PFO may be important and may partially be responsible for harm. The first situation is cryptogenic stroke. By cryptogenic stroke, I mean strokes which happen where no obvious cause is found. In those patients, it has been hypothesized that a PFO could possibly provide a mechanism by which the stroke happens. Remember, most strokes happen because of disease in the blood vessels, it, blood vessels in the brain, the blood vessels in the neck. Uh, sometimes strokes happen because of blood clots within the heart and particularly in patients with atrial fibrillation. If you don't find all those, then you're left with this concept of crypto cryptogenic stroke. Stroke which has occurred and we don't know why. In those people, it has been found that there's a higher incidence of PFO, so a higher prevalence of PFO. So patients with cryptogenic strokes have, are, have a higher prevalence of PFOs. And because of this association, people started wondering whether the PFO in some way contributed to the stroke. Now, it is possible that if you develop a blood clot, say in the legs, Ordinarily, what would happen is that blood clot would go from the legs into the right heart, from the right heart it would go to the lungs, where it may, if it's small, do get destroyed. However, if you have this PFO, then there is a theoretical possibility that the clot could go from the right heart directly into the left heart, bypass the lungs, and from the left heart go to the brain and cause a stroke. So that is one mechanism that has been hypothesized whereby a PFO could contribute to strokes. Uh, however, there's another mechanism and probably a more likely mechanism, and that is that in people who have a PFO, you often see an associated area of the interatrial septum, which is redundant and doesn't contract as well. And this is called an interatrial septal aneurysm. So patients with PFO are more likely to have an associated interatrial septal aneurysm. And if you have an interatrial septal aneurysm, then that part of the septum, which isn't moving, could form an area where blood um, could um, stagnate and thereby form a blood clot and that blood clot could get dislodged and cause the stroke. So that is another mechanism and actually when we look at the research it appears that an isolated PFO without an integral septal aneurysm doesn't seem to be associated with a higher risk of cryptogenic strokes, but if you did have an interatrial septal aneurysm, that actually does increase the risk of cryptogenic stroke, or that is associated with a higher incidence of cryptogenic stroke. Another situation in which a PFO is important is in patients who have migraine and vascular headaches. Now, there's only very low-level evidence to suggest that patients who have uh, that migraine seem to be more common in patients with PFO. And so the hypothesis there is that maybe our venous circulation contains vasoactive substances which could cause migraine, but because the venous blood goes to the lungs, those vasoactive substances in some way get destroyed within the lungs. However, if you have a PFO, it is possible that these vasoactive substances bypass the lungs, go to the brain, and cause the migraine. Um, there is no categorical evidence to confirm this. Uh, it's only low-level evidence, and there's certainly no evidence to suggest that if somehow you can close the PFO, the migraine goes away. 
Another situation in which a PFO is interesting or important is in uh, patients who enjoy scuba diving. Uh, we know the decompression illness or the bends are two to five times more common in patients with PFO and PFO can actually be a contraindication to scuba diving. Uh, however, if the PFO is closed, then the patient can dive again. Finally, there's a really interesting condition called platypnea orthodeoxia syndrome, which is associated with PFO. Now, what happens in this situation is, in this condition, is that patients find that they get breathless when they stand up. When they lie down, they're okay, they're not breathless. When they stand up, they get breathless. When you measure their oxygen levels, their oxygen levels are normal when they're lying down, but as soon as they stand up, their oxygen levels start dropping. And it is thought that in these people, what tends to happen is they usually have uh, either lung disease or they've had part of their lung removed. And therefore, the assumption is that what tends to happen in these people is somehow it's more difficult to, for the blood to be pumped from the right heart into the lungs. And there's some kind of alteration in geometry, which occurs more obviously when they stand up, which allows blood that is coming back into the right heart from the body to directly just go directly through this PFO to the left heart, thereby bypassing the lungs, thereby not collecting any oxygen. And this is why the patient gets breathless and the oxygen levels drop when they stand up. Uh, so that is orthodeoxia platypnea syndrome. How do we diagnose a PFO? Well, you know, the problem with a PFO is that it may, you know, when you just look at it, it may all be closed. You have to increase the pressure on one side to see if you can force the door open. And therefore, a dynamic test is what is needed to be able to pick this thing up. The best way to do it is through echocardiography or ultrasound of the heart. And what we usually do is we would inject a mixture of air bubbles, blood and normal saline, add, uh, mix it up, it creates bubbles and we inject those bubbles in a vein, and the bubbles then go up to the right heart. And as they do that, we ask the patient to strain down, increasing the pressure on the right side of the septum, and thereby encouraging a flap to open up. And if indeed there is a PFO, then you see bubbles entering the right heart, and then almost immediately going into the left heart. In a normal person without a PFO, you will not see any bubbles on the left side. But with a person with a PFO, it becomes very obvious. So that is how you diagnose it. The next question, I guess, is what do you do about it? Uh, and the answer is if it is incidentally found, it is best to leave it alone. You don't need to do anything else. Uh, in patients who have cryptogenic stroke, a lot of people will use antiplatelet agents, so, and you know, um, aspirin or clopidogrel uh, to sort of thin the blood. Uh, but there is some evidence that perhaps closing the hole, um, closing the gap, the PFO, is associated with better outcomes. Um, the problem is that there's not really much funding at the moment available for this, so not many people are sent for PFO closure. Um, when it comes to closure, you can do it through keyhole, so it doesn't require open heart surgery. It can be closed very easily through keyhole. And in fact, in patients who are scuba divers, and in patients who have orthodeoxyplatypnea syndrome, closure is actively recommended. Uh, in patients with migraine, there's no evidence that closure should be considered. Uh, and um, as I say, in those people who have no symptoms, it is best left alone. Uh, so I hope that you found this useful, the overview of PFOs. Um, if you've had a PFO, if you know someone who's had a PFO, I'd love to hear from you. Please leave me a comment. I'd be so, so, so grateful if you'd consider uh, sharing and subscribing. I'm very appreciative of all the nice things you say. It gives me so much confidence. I feel great. Thank you so much. I owe it all to you, you, the viewer, who is so incredibly generous with your time and your uh, kindness towards me. So it means a ton. Um, Finally, uh, if you get a chance, please watch my, uh, please visit my website, which is drsanjaygupta-cardiologist.com, uh, and um, my Instagram page is your cardiology. My Facebook is at your cardiologist, and I have a WhatsApp broadcast, which is uh, accessible on four four seven nine five one three one zero 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 eight. Thank you so much, and all the best. Bye.